to 
invest any more time, creativity, imagination, and love into this whole enterprise, they need to be isolated more. Keep them away from the holy book and keep them away from those things the enemy has given them to remember. Need I repeat them, my, my malevolent, malevolent nephew? Steer them clear from praying too much, from meditating on scripture. Make their gathering at that table as infrequent as possible. After all, the enemy did say, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We don't want them to remember. Busy them with committee work, with rules and processes. Make them tired with endless meetings. Help them to not connect with the Holy One in heaven like what the Son of God did, praying and communing. We can't let them know that they are already loved, that they are already one with each other, that they actually are one with the Holy One. Isolate them. Help them to see it doesn't make sense to keep praying, to keep coming together to gravel and struggle. Whisper in their ears when they are trying to understand each other. We want them to be irritated at differences. The more they squabble about those differences, the more they find irritating their other sisters and brothers, the more they think their arguments and convictions and ideas and doctrines are the good news, the more they will have confused the hopes and vision of the enemy for their own. They're almost with us. Keep feeding them bad news so they will doubt the power of the cross, the power of the empty tomb, and whether the enemy has really been risen. They will soon see the disconnect, the nonsense. How can someone who died rise? How can a mustard seed possibly grow into a tree? How can simply praying, eating the bread and drinking the cup touching the water, gathering for worship, and telling others about the enemy possibly be fulfilled. Give them something else to hope for. After all, their conference is about loss, grief, and reattaching to something else. Give them something else or someone else to attach to, just not the enemy, just not the good news. Keep up the good work, dear nephew. Victory is within our grasp. Jesus answers along the way in the Gospel of John the questions that he has addressed about living either one way or the other. To the Samaritan woman who wants to know whether it's this mountain or that woman, Jesus says, We worship God in spirit and in truth. To Nicodemus, we are born of water and spirit. The light shines in the darkness. Jesus himself personifies the answer to this question to Thomas. Mine is the way. I am the way. And so John gives us, in the testimony of his gospel, answers to our questions. How are we to live in a world that is presented to us in binary, either or, fashion? He presents to us Jesus as a high priest who remains our intercessor. He gives us the Spirit of God through Christ who will send him in Jesus' absence. He tells us that the Word becomes flesh. That water, bread, wine calls us through God's Word and assures us still today. He says that we are incorporated into the triune life of God. We know that we are following Jesus today when we are in solidarity with Him. And we are in solidarity with Jesus when by the Spirit of God we live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We live in solidarity today with Jesus when by the Spirit's power we exercise humility, gentleness, patience, and love. 
We are in solidarity with Jesus when by the Spirit's power we receive gifts for ministry. And when we deploy these gifts in service to the church. And we are in solidarity with Jesus when by the Spirit's power we remain in the bond of peace. We are in solidarity with Jesus by the power of the Spirit as we speak the truth, but only as we do so in love. We are in solidarity with Jesus by the power of the Spirit when we do our part as the church, the body of Christ matures. And friends, we are in solidarity with Jesus when, by the Spirit's power, we live into the unity of the triune God by the Spirit's power. Dear Righteous Father, I'm coming to you as I pray with my brother and Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you say he is our High Priest who forever intercedes for us. That even when we can't pray or don't know how to pray, or even when we are sleeping, he has our back. Just like when I read about how he bowed to you, and pray for others in the family like Peter, John, and James to be one. His prayer is of conviction and from his heart. Righteous Father, my sisters and brothers here are struggling. We are grieving and so many are discouraged because there's deep divisions that get deeper. Relationships are being split. Our memory of what once was a thriving church that is no longer the case. Or at least what we thought was a thriving church with large numbers, a lot of money, and a lot of influence and power in our country. I read about your desire for unity and oneness, but we find disunity and a love that doesn't hold. Righteous Father, why is it like this? Like Habakkuk, how long, O oh Lord, will it be like this? Sometimes it feels like the enemy is winning. The forces of darkness and bad news and death have entered the living room and are trying to keep us grief-stricken, to think that somehow we belong in the funeral home, or that worshiping together and telling the good news aren't enough. Can it be, holy God, that the gifts you've given to us already, the scriptures, the bread, the cup, the font, and community, and the one of whom all these testify, our Lord Jesus, are all sufficient for the journey. Yes, Lord, they are. Thank you. Thank you, the journey is not over. Death has not won. Life in the midst of what feels like death. Hope in the midst of despair. Anguish in the midst of joy. Being at home with you in your heart while being restless until we find our rest in you. Thank you, Father, that your word is true. We are one in you because you are one with Jesus and he with you in the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your enduring promise and your enduring call your generous love that never lets us go. That there is one Lord as you received us in one baptism in the one faith and connected us as one family even so many times it doesn't feel like it. Lord, I can testify of your goodness when you helped my own congregation through the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Team and our own Presbyterian Disaster Team and how they visited the building facility of Middlesex Presbyterian Church last Sunday, and how you provided $1,000 this last Friday to help to replace the roof that was damaged by that hurricane. Thank you so much, Father, for that, for a caring church family, for our one family in the faith. Lord, in, in one of the treasures you inspired your church almost 450 years ago, the height of our catechism, you know, in that part that talks about the part of our baptismal creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth, and where the Catechism says that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth, and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ the Son. I trust God so much that I do not doubt that He will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and will turn to my good whatever adversity He sends upon me in this sad world. God is able to do this because He is Almighty God, and desires to do this because He is a faithful Father. Thank you, Almighty God, you are able. And thank you, faithful Father, that you desire to provide for us, that you will protect us from all adversity, that your calling upon us endures, and that you are using us in small ways and big ways, in ordinary ways to do extraordinary things, to equip and encourage each other, so that your body, even in its broken state, will be built up in love. Thanks be to God. Sisters and brothers in Christ,